is one of the least known stories in American history. It is the story of black achievement and accomplishment. Against all odds, American blacks have built their own institutions, families, schools, churches, and businesses. Against all odds, American blacks have created great art and science, fought heroically in every American war. Against all odds, black men and women have worked endlessly to secure their own freedom and equality. The untold story of blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. This is that story. Hello, I'm James Avery. Welcome to A History of Black Achievement in America. Episode one covers the most critical period for blacks in America, a time when black Africans were defined as property, a time when many were enslaved against their will. It was also the time when the nation's founding fathers had the chance to end this horrendous injustice, but did not. Yet we will see that in the 180 years before the Constitution was penned, black Americans had already created a substantial legacy of accomplishment. Was enslavement in America always based on skin color? Absolutely not. For the first 40 years, some blacks from Africa and the Caribbean did arrive as slaves and indentured servants. Others came as free men and women. They were skilled artisans and farmers. They worked with whites to establish England's Atlantic colonies, which formed the nucleus of what would become the United States of America. When descendants of the early American colonists travel back to the old country in search of their heritage, they travel to Europe. That is where most will go, but not all. Some will go to places like this, prisons on the west coast of Africa. It is often thought that these two very different places of origin produced a dominant, distinct white culture and a subordinated, distinct black subculture. Actually, the New World transformed both groups as they jointly invented a new mind, a new voice, and a new identity. The American mind, the American voice, and the American identity. In May of 1607, Three ships carrying 105 settlers arrived in Jamestown, Virginia. Jamestown would become the first English settlement. Twelve years later, a Dutch ship arrived. On board were 20 African blacks. They were indentured servants and they were for sale. The black experience in America was about to begin. For the next 200 years, the history of America is primarily the history of whites from England and blacks from Africa and the West Indies. It would be a history that would inexorably move the people of the Atlantic seaboard toward the founding of a great new nation, a nation divided by color. However, in the early days, skin color was not as important as religion in determining who had rights and who didn't. Christians had rights, others did not. Some blacks were slaves, but many were indentured servants, as were many whites. As indentured servants, both could work, save money, and become free in Jamestown Colony. There were a variety of ways in which uh, a black in this early period and throughout slavery could gain their freedom. For example, uh, they could serve in the local militia, uh, fighting against Indians and sometimes fighting against other Europeans, and that would be a way to gain one's freedom. 
uh, in the colony of South Carolina. Later than Virginia, we have the instance where blacks can gain their freedom by working for European entrepreneurs and going into the wilderness, learning Indian languages, and acting as agents for uh, colonial, white colonial salesmen. So that would be a way. If you did some extraordinary service for the community, for the colony, you could also win your freedom. And in some cases, it was possible when slaves were able to make money, and sometimes slaves were, they could work on their own depending on how their uh, master responded to that kind of uh, pressure. They could work on their own and gain enough funds to buy their freedom. So even though you had the institution of slavery, there are three or four ways that blacks can gain their freedom right up until the Civil War. One such person was Anthony Johnson. Johnson arrived in Virginia in 1621 and was immediately put to work on a plantation along the James River. The 1625 Virginia census referred to him as Antonio the Negro. Later, Antonio changed his name to Anthony Johnson. He prospered, got married to an African woman known as Mary and raised four Christian children. In the 1630s, he and his family purchased their freedom and acquired an estate of 250 acres, which he farmed with the help of white indentured servants and at least one black slave. Johnson even won a documented court case when he successfully sued to have his slave returned to him when the slave was stolen by white neighbors. In 1665, he moved to Maryland and leased a 300-acre plantation, where he died five years later. Anthony Johnson was one of the first American settlers, carving land out of the wilderness, creating and shaping the plantation system. In fact, white planters depended heavily on the knowledge and skills of slaves in growing rice, raising cattle, and building irrigation canals. Many of the first-generation blacks in the colonies who came from Africa via the West Indies were sophisticated, speaking several languages and possessing many skills. White planters depended heavily on the knowledge and skills of slaves in growing rice, raising cattle, and building irrigation canals. In this next segment, skin color and enslavement become linked in America. Today in the United States, when a black person sees a white, or a white person sees a black, there is an instantaneous response of other, that the other person is not the same, not the same as me, fundamentally different, perhaps even inferior. This reaction is based on skin color, yet it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way any more than if brunettes saw blondes and had the instantaneous reaction of other. This sense of other came about because of events in the 17th century. These events led to the enactment of the Virginia Slave Codes of 1705 which read in part, all servants imported and brought into the country who were not Christians in their native country shall be accounted and be slaves. All Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves within this dominion shall be held to be real estate. If any slave resists his master, correcting such slave, and shall happen to be killed in such correction, the master shall be free of all punishment, as if such accident never happened. One by one, America's colonies and later the states adopted slave codes. Enslavement of one human by another 
goes back to the transition from hunter-gatherer to agricultural societies around 8000 BC and is based on the economic principle of the demand for a reliable and controlled labor force. By the time Western Europe explored the New World in the 16th century, all European countries believed they had the right to enslave non-Christian families and soldiers captured in wars. But the Spanish Inquisition in the 15th and 16th centuries heightened this sense of other. Under the Inquisition, non-Christians took on the quality of the devil. Muslims, Jews, and pagan blacks, who were clearly non-Christian, were considered subhuman and enslaved or even killed. After Spain and Portugal conquered South and Central America and the Caribbean islands, they needed a strong labor force to work the highly profitable sugar plantations that emerged in all three places. Enslavement was the answer. Attempts to enslave the native populations ended in failure because they could easily escape back to their communities and into a land in which they felt comfortable. The permanent answer lay in Sub-Sahara Africa. Here was an abundant supply of non-Christians suitable for enslavement. In the New World, they would have no place to escape to, no friends, and be unable to blend in. Slavery had existed in Africa for centuries prior to the European slave trade, but it never had been based on skin color and did not result in the dehumanization and death of the transatlantic voyage to the New World. But by the middle of the 17th century, skin color and slavery were about to be joined in Virginia, where planters now needed laborers to work the tobacco fields. The problem with the Christian definition of other had a loophole. Blacks were constantly converting to Christianity and therefore had the right to gain their freedom. And as the number of blacks grew in America, Revolt also became more likely as the enslaved now had a free black community on the outside to escape to. The answer was to define other and therefore enslavement on skin color alone. In order to have a controllable and reliable source of labor, the English needed to define enslaved blacks as property. And with all property, one could do what one wanted with one's own property. None of this had to be this way, but it turned out this way. If we go back and examine the European economic expansion in the 1520s through the 1540s, uh, they find what they call the New World. They want to develop it for uh, people living there, settlement, but also develop it economically. They try European labor, but it's never enough. They try Indian labor, that doesn't work either. The Indians are able to run away. Uh, they don't have the same kind of technological knowledge that the Europeans needed to develop, that is, tear down the uh, forest and then develop uh, a plantation economy. The manpower from the Europeans' point of view that was available were the Africans. And they argued that the Africans were, quote, unprotected, and therefore we could go there, get them, and use them for slaves. By unprotected, they meant that they weren't Christians, and so they weren't connected to any European churches. Uh, none of their countries had diplomatic or political relationships with European countries. So they were, from the Europeans' point of view, available. And if those two things were true, that they were unprotected, uh, no one would stop the Europeans from, except the Africans would stop the Europeans from going in there, trying to capture them. And the slave trade, was so lucrative, that is, it made so much money, that every European nation, uh, Spain, Portugal, England, Holland, France, uh, all engaged in the slave trade. <laughs> 
From the beginning, not all colonists believed in the slave codes and the branding of other solely on the basis of skin color. Finally, in 1865, slavery came to an end in America, but the effect of what started during the Spanish Inquisition had been passed on from generation to generation. For this, blacks would pay a terrible price over the years, and their accomplishments should be more cherished because of what they had to overcome. Perhaps, America too will not reach its fullest potential until whites and blacks see one another without that sense of other. In spite of the slave codes, blacks who arrived in America were talented and skilled individuals who worked hard as slaves and as free men and women became successful landowners, merchants, and craftsmen. Indeed, free blacks demonstrated the same American initiative as whites, establishing shops, businesses, or becoming professionals. Some were poets, such as Phyllis Wheatley, whose book, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, was the first published by a black American woman in 1773. Now typical of these early black achievers is Samuel Francis. He was a longtime confidant of George Washington. He was the man who managed the first presidential mansion in New York City. It was in his tavern that New York's Sons of Liberty met to foment independence and revolution. He, along with such men as Ben Franklin, John Hancock, and John Jacob Astor, formed America's first entrepreneurial class. He was Samuel Francis, and he was black. Samuel Francis was born in the West Indies in 1722. By 1762, he was a well-known restaurateur and innkeeper in two of America's great cities, New York and Philadelphia. Built around 1757, Francis purchased the Delancey Mansion in Lower Manhattan in 1762. When Francis opened the tavern, he called it Sign of Queen Charlotte. Later, it was shortened to Queen's Head. In 1765, he left the tavern and opened a waxworks museum. Then in 1770, as the American Revolution approached, he returned once more to manage the tavern and renamed it the Francis Tavern. The tavern was a meeting place for the Sons of Liberty as they organized their tactics against the British. In 1774, they met at the tavern to plan dumping tea into the Hudson River. When the British left New York in 1781, the Francis Tavern became George Washington's headquarters. In fact, it was Washington's residence in the last days of the war. In the tavern's long room on December 4th, 1783, Washington delivered his emotional farewell speech to his officers. Five years later, when Washington became president, he asked Francis to serve as steward of his New York executive mansion. When the nation's capital relocated to Philadelphia in 1790, Francis relocated too. Washington wrote these words to Francis in a letter. You have invariably, through the most trying times, maintained a constant friendship and attention to the cause of our country and its independence and freedom. Francis had a reputation as a bon vivant he owned many establishments in New York and Philadelphia and was known for creating the restaurant craze. He was one of the most remarkable entrepreneurs of his era. Samuel Francis preceded Washington in death at the age of 72 in 1795. His legacy remains in the tavern he founded a tavern that not only survived the shelling by British cannons in 1776, but also the attack by Al-Qaeda on September 11, 2001.
With the arrival of the Revolutionary War, over 5,000 blacks stepped forward to fight for freedom from Britain. Indeed, without the black troops, the war might have been lost. Today, blacks and whites fight side by side in the United States military. The men and women of America's armed forces are colorless comrades in every sense of the word. Indeed, in the Persian Gulf War of 1991, America's top military commander, General Colin L. Powell, chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, was black. The black military patriot goes way back to the Revolutionary War and the founding of Boston's Minutemen. It goes back to the first man to die in the cause of freedom, Crispus Attucks. Crispus Attucks was born into slavery on a farm in Framingham, Massachusetts in 1723. His father, a black slave, married a Native American, and the Attucks family worked for a wealthy landowner, William Brown. In 1750, when Brown denied Crispus the right to buy his freedom, the young man, like many other blacks of his day, escaped bondage and won his freedom on board an Nantucket whaling ship. For the next 20 years, Crispus Attucks all but disappeared from the history books. But on March 5, 1770, as legend has it, a stout man later identified as Crispus Attucks led a group of sailors to the Boston Custom House, where cries and shouts were coming from colonists confronting British soldiers. Earlier, a young colonial boy had been severely beaten by the British, and Bostonians were incensed. Attucks picked up a barrel stave, pushed his way to the front of the mob, and dared the soldiers to fire. At some point, Attucks struck the musket of a soldier. The man fired, then eight more fired. Attucks was the first to fall, pierced by two musket balls. Four others were killed and six more wounded. Paul Revere immediately created a woodcut of the incident. Dubbed the Boston Massacre, it became the rallying cry for freedom and revolution. Eventually, over 5,000 blacks followed Crispus Attucks and served in the Continental Army. After the Boston Massacre, Blacks fought prominently at Lexington and Concord. At the Battle of Bunker Hill, black militiamen earned high commendations from the Massachusetts legislature. Though their heroics were known to George Washington when he assumed command of the Continental Army in July 1775, he still barred the enlistment of blacks. But after large-scale desertions at Valley Forge, Washington was forced to reconsider his rash action, and he allowed blacks into the army. In fact, over 700 blacks fought at the Battle of Monmouth in 1778, where their valor meant the difference between defeat and victory. Eventually, Washington had to admit that the black soldiers in his army were the best soldiers he had. Blacks' courage was much more than a fight for the liberty of their adopted country. They fought for freedom for themselves and their people. You see a strain in um, writing by revolutionary soldiers, by black soldiers at the time who are beginning to form uh, a kind of patriotic nationalist feeling about America, uh, but at the same time developing uh, a stream that will find itself in black nationalist thought um, that, well, we can't set too much store by that because we can see where this might be heading. So there was a real paradox in, for the black soldier fighting in the Revolutionary War. Uh, this is our home. We do want to fight for it. We understand the terms. Um, but we also have our own interest here. And, and, and so they were developing um, at once a kind of loyalty to this emerging uh, nation, but at the same time a critique of that emerging nation, seeing that what the role of blacks would be. Unfortunately, the Revolutionary War was a mixed bag for American blacks. Though the northern states freed their slaves, they did not give them political equality, as promised in the Declaration of Independence. Southern black soldiers, many of whom fought on the side of the British, suffered a worse fate. 
most were rounded up and forced back into slavery. Others were killed as they tried to join British ships departing for England. However, it was clear that the black soldier was equal to any in the world and an integral part of the United States securing its freedom, a freedom that the black soldier continues to fight for into the 21st century. The Revolutionary War was a turning point for blacks. Not only did they willingly fight for freedom, which many were not permitted to have, but black intellectuals also realized if they were to achieve freedom and equality, they would have to do so by their own efforts. In the next program, we shall see that these efforts took many forms, building their own institutions, even rebellion against those who enslaved them. But most importantly, the next era saw the creation of the abolitionist movement, which led to the Civil War. Thank you for watching. I'm James Avery.